Shalom. Pura vida, mi gente. Pura vida is what we say in my part of Mesoamerica. It means pure life. Are you living pure life? Right here it says studies in history, economics, and public law. Edited by the Faculty of Political Science of Columbia University. All right, and it's titled Indian Slavery in Colonial Times Within the Present Limits of the United States by Alman Wheeler. Lauber PhD, All right, Columbia University, 1913. From the beginning of the colony, the settlers of Carolina were in trouble with the Indians. In September 1671, war was declared against the Cuso, a tribe on the southern frontier who posed as allies of the Spaniards. All right, so this tribe was allied with the Spaniards, the Cuso and who vexed the Carolina settlers with petty depredations. The Cuso were quickly defeated and the prisoners sent to be sold out of the colony unless ransomed by their countrymen. During the war with the Stono Indians in 1680, the captive Indians were brought to Charleston and sold by Governor West to the traders in the colony to be carried to the West Indies as slaves. Again, they, who? Indians, right? Being sent to the West Indies as slaves or servants. We're in the book now. It's called Indian Slaves from Caribana. Trade and labor in the 17th century Caribbean. So the 1600s, right? 1600s. Carolyn Mary Arena is the author, right? Submitted in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of Doctor of philosophy in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, Columbia University, 2017. And it says here, abstract, or I guess uh, like the introduction, it says here, indigenous resistance made Caribbean colonization a slow and violent process in the period of 1580 to 1690. All right, again, 1580, 1690. The Caribbean Indians who rejected colonization became targets for enslavement. Slavers captured indigenous people in raids or through trade within indigenous dominated territories. I conceptualized this space as Caribana. Geographically, it stretched from Guiana 
northward throughout islands of the Lesser Antilles. I focus on the indigenous captives from Caribana who were enslaved in English and Dutch colonies, namely Barbados, Curaçao, and Suriname. I show how colonists justified enslaving indigenous people in the same manner as they justified the transatlantic African slave trade. All right, so she's telling you, just like the so-called transatlantic slave trade, it was happening here way before that. Just like it, despite widespread taboos against the former practice and not the latter. You see? So, because they always acknowledge the latter, right, which is called the transatlantic, but we already know that's in reverse, but they ignore what's happened before the so-called transatlantic slave trade happened. These taboos did not prevent Indian slavery, but they influenced the creation of 17th century histories, government reports, and other material for public and European consumption. Indian slavery has thus been written about, then and now, as limited phenomenon, wherein Indians had limited and specific labor roles, example as fishermen or domestic servants, domestic servants, indentured servants, encomenda. However, sources such as deeds and tax rolls show that more Indian slaves than assumed, more Indian slaves than assumed contributed a broad range of skills to plantations, econ economies. So more Indian slaves assumed than assumed, meaning more than what they have told us, actually contributed to a broad range of skills to plantation economies. English Barbados was exceptionally successful because it was ge geographically separate from the conflicts that created captives in Caribana, but nevertheless extracted Indian slaves from the region. Meanwhile, colonies abuted in Caribana, such as Suriname, faced trade sanctions from neighboring Indians and rebellions if they abused the Indian slave trade. Indian slave trade. From 1670s to 1690s, colonial governments limited the means of accessing Indian slaves, but once enslaved, they faced the same restrictive black codes you hear this black codes that allowed the brutal treatment of them as inheritable chattel all right we're just talking about american indians not africans so again we're still in the book indian slavery in colonial times within the present limits of the united states by almond wheeler lobber phd again this is studies in history economics and public law edited by the Faculty of Political Science of Columbia. The chief, though not the earliest, source of Indian slaves, so the chief source of Indian slaves among the French was that of captives taken in war with the Indian tribes. For many years after the coming of the French to Louisiana, they and the Natchez Indians lived in friendly intercourse. Minor Indian troubles in 1711 and 1715 resulted in the enslavement and transportation of certain Indians to Cape Francois on the island of Haiti. All right, so where are these Indians, the descendants of these Indians in Haiti? All right, we know who's there. All right, the hostilities begun with the Natchez Indians in 1715 continued intermittently until 1740. In 1730, because of ill treatment by M. Du Chapard, governor of Fort Rosali, who wished the site of a Natchez village on which to build a town, and because of other abuses, the Natchez rose against the French and massacred over 200 of them. All right, so the Natchez weren't having it. They were trying to take their land, everything away from them. Right, so they were not having it, and you know, they killed over 200 of them, it says here. Continuing, Governor Perrier formed an army and advanced against them in their fort. The Natchez offered to leave the place if their lives were spared. So they decided, all right, they're gonna kill us, so let's just give them the land and so we can survive. Their offer was accepted, but they were detained as prisoners. So even though they accepted their offer, they still detained them as prisoners, all but 20 who escaped. So all of them became prisoners. We're talking about the whole Natchez Nation Indians, right? Only 20 of them escaped. About 450 of the tribe, including their great son, the little son, and several of the principal war chiefs were captured 
and carried to New Orleans. All right, you hear this, right? The women and children were retained as slaves on the plantations. Who? The not chess, not Africans, were retained as slaves on the plantations. Some of the prisoners were burned in New Orleans. The great son, the little son, their families, and more than 400 of the captives were sent were sent at once to Cape Francois, Haiti, and most of them sold to the planters as slaves again. Right, the primary families, the chiefs, the war chiefs, the great son and little son, and their families, along with 400 of their captives, we're talking about the Natchez tribal people, were sent to where? Haiti. All right, we know they were sent to the Caribbean. Now we know exactly where. Haiti. So is a lot of the Haitians Natchez people? Yes, they are. All right, again. Once they got there, most of them sold to the planters as slaves. All right, so these are the slaves. These aren't Africans. The two chiefs and their families were retained as prisoners on the island of Haiti, right? On April 22nd, 1731, the minister informed the company that in his opinion, the only solution of the matter lay in selling as slaves the survivors of the two families. They were too much trouble for them. So they said the only solution is selling them as slaves. All right. In Haiti, the Natchez, War Chiefs and their families. The registers of the company contained the following record. It was resolved to order the sale of the survivors of the said two families of Natchez Indians. All right. We're going to read from uh, this article in this journal. Uh, it's called Indian Slavery in Colonial Georgia by Rodney M. Bain. This is from the Georgia Historical Quarterly, Volume 79, Number 2, Summer of 1995, pages 418 to 424. Of course, slavery was not a new concept by the time the English colonized the coast of southeastern North America, nor had it been introduced by the Spanish who preceded them. Slavery had long been a way of life among the various Indian nations, but the practice was much expanded during the 17th and 18th centuries, when thousands of southeastern Indians were captured by warring tribes and Moravian whites were sent into bondage farther north or in the West Indies, far removed from their own tribes. All right, and it's titled Indian Slavery in Colonial Times Within the Present Limits of the United States by Almond Wheeler Lauber, Ph.D. All right, Columbia University, 1913. The breaking out of the war of the Spanish succession in 1701 gave Governor Moore, okay, Moore, a chance to attack the Spanish Indians, capture and sell them under the excuse of the rules of war. Therefore, in 1702, he led a force of militia and Indians against St. Augustine, burned the city, and carried off as slaves whatever Indians he could obtain from the Spanish Indian villages along the way. A second attack on St. Augustine was made by Moore in 1704 with the purpose of destroying missions and carrying off slaves. An advance into the territories of the Apalachee resulted in the destruction of several missions and the capture of more than a thousand Indians, some free, some slave. Nearly all the Apalachee were distributed as slaves among the Carolina settlers. All right, now see who they're putting in these plantations, right? The Carolinas, all right? The enslavement of Indians indeed was carried on wholesale. A letter to the proprietors, July 10, 1708, states that the garrison of St. Augustine is by this war reduced to the bare walls. Their cattle and Indians towns all consumed either by us in our invasion of that place or by our Indian subjects. They have driven the Floridians to the islands of the Cape, have brought in and sold many hundreds of them, and many now continue that trade, so that in some five years they'll reduce the barbarians to a fearless number. They're talking about American Indians. In 1708, Colonel Barnwell of South Carolina made an expedition to the Appalachian province of Florida. It is thought that this was the time when Captain Naim of South Carolina, with a party of Jamasee Indians, advanced to the vicinity of Lake 
Okeechobee and brought back a number of captive Indians as slaves. A similar expedition of Colonel Palmer in 1727 against the Jamasi resulted in the destruction of many Indian towns, the slaughter of many natives, and the carrying off of great numbers to Charleston as slaves. All right, so where Charleston? We know Charleston was a big slave port, uh, basically where most of the, a lot of the American Indians were, were sent out to other parts of the world. We're talking about including Europe and West Africa. All right. As the result of the three expeditions sent by South Carolina from 1702 to 1708 against the Jamasee, Appalachian, and Timucua of Northern Florida, they were they was carried back to Charleston for sale as slaves. Almost the entire population of seven towns in all, some 1,400 persons. All right. And they'll tell you when you try to look for up for a lot of these tribes, which I learned about recently, the Timucua, right? These are tribes they never teach you about, right? But yeah, they're like, oh, what happened? They disappeared or, you know, they you know, exterminated. But you see what happened, really. All right. How many times did this happen that they got invaded and then there's 1,400 now and then another 1,400, you know, here and there. Eventually, you know, they blend in with other tribes or they become, you know, servants and in, in, in plantations. And that's what really happened. Those are you, your ancestors. All right. So-called Negroes. The captives taken in 1715. When the Jamasee and Creek Indians made a foray upon the South Carolina frontier, were sold as slaves. All right. Mr. Johnston, a South Carolina missionary of the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign, in foreign Parts, in his letter to the Society, December 19, 1715, states, It is certain many of the Jamusees and Creek Indians were against the war all along. But our military men were so bent upon revenge and so desirous to enrich themselves by making all the Indian slaves that fall into your hands. Throughout the Tuscarora War in North Carolina, Indian captives were retained or sold as slaves. At the beginning of military operations, following the Indian Massacre of 1711, the friendly Indians agreed to help the English against their enemy upon promise of a reward of six blankets for each man killed by them and the usual price of slaves for each woman and child delivered as captives. During the course of the war, several hundred Indian allies were used by the English and these allies took advantage of the opportunity to obtain large number of Indian captives to sell to the slave traders of the time. All right, you hear that? In an attack on an Indian fort in 1711, 39 women and children were captured and disposed of in the settlements as slaves. The two chief expeditions during the war were those of Colonel Barnwell, who was sent by South Carolina in January 1712, and of Colonel Moore in January and February of 1713. Colonel Barnwell's expedition took 200 Indian women and children prisoners. The expedition of Colonel Moore virtually ended the war by capturing the fort in which the Tuscarora had taken refuge. 900 men, women, and children were killed or taken prisoners. And that's, again, what we really are. Prisoners of war, POWs, not descendants of slaves. In both expeditions, the Allied Indians secured as many as possible of the captured Indians whom they took along with them to sell as slaves in Charleston. And they still further increased their supply of slaves by attacking the peaceful Indians along the route of their return to South Carolina. During the course of the war, more than 700 Indians were sold into slavery. All right, you see number nine there, footnote. You want to go read it? It says, Bassett. John Hopkins University Studies, all right, page 73. Go read it if you want. The earliest of the slave-producing wars in New England was that with the Pequot in 1637. The war consisted of two battles, the Mystic Fight and the Swamp Fight. In the first, these two events, but seven captives were taken 
and the second, the Swan Fight, about 180 captives were taken. Two of the Sakims, Sakem, taken in the Swan Fight were spared, on promise that they guide the English to the retreat of Sasakus. The other men captives, some 20 or 30 in number, were put to death. The remaining captives consisted of about 80 women and children, they, so they kept the women and children, were divided. Some were given to the soldiers, whether gratis or for pay does not appear. 30 were given to the Narragansett, who were allies with the English. 48 were sent to Massachusetts, and the remainder were assigned to Connecticut. The women and girls of the Massachusetts captives were distributed among the towns. It seems probable that Connecticut made a similar disposition of its share of the captives regardless of sex. The male children among the Massachusetts captives were ordered by the Massachusetts General Court in 1637 to be carried to the Bermudas by William Pierce and sold there as slaves, Indian children, Indian children, not Africans, were sent, right, to the Bermudas, right, and they were sold there as slaves. The shipload of Indians, the shipload of Indians, however, consisting of 15 boys and two women was taken by Captain Pierce to the West Indies instead of to the Bermudas and disposed of at the island of Providence. Big one right there. All right, so these Pequot, right? They were sent to Providence Island. This is off the coast of Honduras, Nicaragua around there, in between like, uh, you know, like, you know, from those countries and Jamaica. And, you know, a lot of those people ended up with the mosquitoes or mosquito people. And they're supposed to be Africans, but we know you know, if you saw part three of this, you know, series, right? We know it was actually American Indians that they were taken there. And these same Pequot, they were called cannibal Negroes. They were calling them in another book. We can show you that. Cannibal Negroes. All right. So one Pequot seized near Block Island was sent to England. It is possible that this single cargo of women and children was not the only one sent to the islands at this time. A letter from the Company of Providence Islands replying from London July 3, 1638 to letters from authorities on the island and directing that special care be taken of the cannibal Negroes brought from New England. What did I just tell you? And I didn't know this was on this book too, all right? But I just told you, and I was going to show you the actual book this is written, this is quoted from, I have it. But you can see it right now. I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> all right, so it says, again, this letter said, yo, you need to take special care of these cannibal Negroes brought from New England. They're talking about Pequots, Pequot, in American Indians. In the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a similar disposal of captives was accomplished. On one occasion, about 200 were transported and sold. There is extant a paper written by Daniel Gooking in 1676, one item of which is as follows. And it says, a list of the Indians, children, that came in with John of Pakakuhi. The list shows 21 boys, and 11 girls distributed throughout the colony. With the close of the war after Philip's death, many of the Indian chiefs were executed at Boston and Plymouth, and most of the remaining chiefs with their captives, followers were sold and shipped off as slaves outside the colonies. Those transported were carried to various parts. The Spanish West Indies, Spain, Portugal, Bermuda, Virginia, and the Azores, all right? See all the places where American Indians were sent to be servants or so-called slaves, right? Spanish West Indies, right? The West Indies, Spain, right? Europe, Portugal, we're talking about Seville and Lisbon, 
These were huge slave markets, especially for American Indians, Bermuda, Virginia, and the Azores. The Indian slaves from Caribana, trade and labor in the 17th century, Caribbean, so the 1600s, right? Carolyn Mary Arena is the author, right? Submitted in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, Columbia University, 2017. All right, so now we're really in the introduction, I guess. So it says here, in 1668, a member of Charles II's Trade Council, and uh, read up on that, the Trade Council, Benjamin Worsley considered strategies for supplying plantation laborers for the English sugar colonies, particularly the new acquisition of Jamaica. So they had taken this from Spain. It says Worsley wrote that if the English Caribbean wanted to be sole masters of sugar for all the world, they could potentially use Guiana, the region of the north coast of South America between the Orinoco and Amazon rivers as a source for Indian slaves. Again, so these English were setting up shop, right? They had just acquired Jamaica. They're going to set up a sugar plantation and they're already planning to get their slaves, not from Africa, right? But from the region on the north coast of South America between the Orinoco and Amazon rivers. This is in Guyana as a source for Indian slaves, not Africans. He argued that it would take less time and thus be more profitable, less time, right? Than bringing people all the way from Africa and thus be more profitable to transport slaves within the Caribbean region rather than from Africa. More profitable, less time to transport slaves within the Caribbean region rather than from Africa. Nevertheless, as this dissertation will highlight, each of these sources contained references to how Indian slaves contributed to the transformation of the Caribbean economy. So who had a strong influence in the transformation of the Caribbean economy? It was Indian slaves. And these sources contain many references of that. Just letting you know. Ad hoc purchases through captive markets and raids on indigenous communities during periods of war threatened Caribbean natives throughout the 17th century. All right, and it's titled Indian Slavery in Colonial Times Within the Present Limits of the United States by Alman Wheeler Lauber, PhD. During the Indian Wars in Virginia, Governor Berkeley himself, in a letter, 1668, to Robert Smith, militia, commander in the Rappahanno country, not only proposed that, with the consent of the Council of War, a war of extinction be waged against the northern Indians, but also suggested that the colonial government defray the expenses of the undertaken by the disposal of the women and children. Smith submitted Governor Berkeley's letter to the Rappahannock Court for approval. In rendering their decision, the justices declared that the conduct of the Northern Indians, notably Duagos and the neighboring Indians, justified the taking of severe measures against them and accordingly advised, with the assistance of Almighty God, by the strength of our Northern part, utterly to eradicate them without further encroachment than the spoils of our enemies. All right, you hear all this, right? Then we're in the book, Indian Slaves from Caribana, Trade and Labor in the 17th Century, Caribbean. And it says here, a number of accounts, deeds, and laws testify to the presence of Indian slaves on Barbados from its first settlement in 1627. Again, a number of accounts, deeds, and laws testify to the presence of Indian slaves on Barbados from its first settlement in 1627, right from the beginning. These were Indians that was always Indians and was, always was Indians. Deeds used the language Negroes, Indians, and other slaves. 
all right so these deeds they use the same language right as in the states in the north when they were classifying all your ancestors together and, and started making tags and, and you know the census records and so these deeds and these islands as well you know had a uh, language like negroes indians and other slaves to describe the laboring population attached to the properties sold the barbados laws and acts printed for richard hall in london in 6 1764 indicates that for all laws passed regarding indians one should see slaves again in 1764 the barbados laws and acts indicates that for all laws passed regarding indians one should see slaves all right so they made it synonymous all right and it's titled indian slavery in colonial times within the present limits of the united states by Almond wheeler lobber phd during bacon's rebellion in 1676 the assembly at his instigation declared the enslavement of indians for life to be legal again during bacon's rebellion in 1676 the assembly at his instigation declared the enslavement of indians for life to be legal and made provisions for granting captive indians to soldiers as a partial inducement to volunteer this act was repealed by the general act setting aside all the acts of this assembly that sat in 1676 under the rule of bacon but it was again revived by the assembly of 1679 called by deputy governor Cicelli. legal enslavement of indians was prohibited by implication rather than by the terms of the act of 1691 but the North Carolina Indian troubles in November 1711 once more brought the old law forward and captives Indians belonging to tribes at war with the English were directed to be transported and sold, those capturing them to have the money of the sale. It will be noted that, though in the case of Virginia, as in that of the other colonies, the disposal of the Indians captured in war was sanctioned by the colonial government the action of the Virginia government in the matter ended with that sanction. By the acts of 1643 and 1658, the colony lost the right to possess servants. Therefore, the government during the Indian Wars decreed that the captive Indians were the property of their captors, who were entitled to the proceeds of their sale. In the case of Maryland, is found another colony in which the government intended that the Indian captives taken in war should be sold for the benefit of the colony. At the time of the Puritan ascendancy, the Indians began to be troublesome. The Nanticoke of the Eastern Shore began a war upon the settlers. March 29, 1652, on petition of the settlers, the General Assembly attempted to pass a militia act an expedition was planned and a levy of troops made. The captive Indians were to be sold, but the government never had a chance to carry out any such sale, for the Puritans of Anne Arundel County refused to make their le le levies, and the expedition had to be abandoned. During the Tuscarora War in North Carolina, one again finds an instance of a colonial government taking possession of the captive Indians, selling them as slaves, and depositing the proceeds of the sales in the colonial treasury. At the breaking out of the war, Governor Hyde instructed the agents whom he sent to South Carolina to ask for military aid to represent to the colonial authorities there the great advantage that may be made of slaves there being many hundreds of them, women and children, may we not believe three or four thousand, again, three or four thousand, they're plotting, talking about you, your ancestors, so-called Negroes, they were going to send to these, their colonies all over the world and in the United States and West Indies, all right, there's at least three to four thousand, all right, they were plotting. The colony indeed found the disposal of the captives to be as profitable as had been hoped. 
the promised reward of slaves as pay for services rendered brought the desired Indian allies. On one occasion, Tom Blunt, chief of the tribe of friendly Indians in the area of disturbance, and making arrangements with the colonial government for an attack on a certain tribe, specified that his warriors receive payment in captives in failing these and other commodities. The journals of the North Carolina Council for June 25th, uh, 1713, show negotiations between acting Governor Pollock and the Council for the purchase of a number of Indians for shipment to the West Indies. For what? For shipment to the West Indies. It was sometimes a problem to provide for the captured Indians. Consequently, in the same year, the assembly chartered a private slop to carry away captives brought by friendly Indians. In South Carolina, the Indian captives taken in early war with the Cuso were sold as slaves by governor and council with the sanction of the proprietors, who, though they had forbidden the enslavement of Indians in the temporary laws sent out to the governor's sale in 1671, were nevertheless the first to grant the privilege of selling Indian captives from Carolina to the West Indies as the cheapest means of encouraging the soldiers of the infant colony. Accordingly, when the war broke out with the Stono Indians in 1680, Governor West taken advantage of the president already established and the express sanction of the proprietors for such an action, offered a price for every Indian that should be taken and brought to Charleston and obtained the funds he needed for, for defense by selling the Indians to the traders. Who were these traders? Right? The plan proved successful. So successful, in fact, as to arouse the jealousy of the proprietors. For West appropriated some of the profits for his own benefit. The proprietors sanctioned the sale of Indians taken in actual warfare for the benefit of the colony, which meant for their own benefit. The title to the colony rested upon the claims of England to this territory by right of conquest. The Indians were the captives and the conquered people of that conquest. By the rules of war, the conquered people were at the mercy and disposal of the conquerors. And since the proprietors found more profits in selling than in killing the captive Indians, they naturally resented West taking their profits for other purposes all right so you hear all what's going on in between their little bees again we got this before this is another book we've gone over it's called the 19th annual report of the bureau of american ethnology to the secretary of the smithsonian institute 1897 to 98 by jw powell all right so uh we in this page where it says in regard to the contact between the two races by which such stories could be borrowed from one by the other, it is not commonly known that in all the southern colonies, Indian slaves were bought and sold and kept in servitude, again servitude, servitude, and worked in the fields side by side with Negroes or so-called Negroes, other American Indians, up to the time of the revolution. Not to go back to the Spanish period, when such things were the order of the day. Of enslaving American Indians putting them in encomiendas or servitude. We find the Cherokee as early as 1693 complaining that their people were being kidnapped by slave hunters. Hundreds of captured Tuscarora and nearly the whole tribe of the Appalachee were distributed as slaves among the Carolina colonists in the early part of the 18th century while the Natchez and others shared similar fate in Louisiana. And as late as least as 1776, Cherokee prisoners of war were still sold to the highest bidder for the same purpose. At one time, it was charged against the governor of South Carolina that he was provoking a general Indian war 
by his encouragement of slave hunts. Furthermore, as the coast tribes dwindled, they were compelled to associate and intermarry with the Negroes, so-called Negroes, right? Until they finally lost their identity and were classed with that race. So American Indians became Negroes. They're telling you right now they were classed with that race. So that a considerable proportion of the blood of the Southern Negroes is unquestionably Indian. The owner. Continuing the book, Indian Slavery in Colonial Times Within the Present Limits of the United States, says here, as a part of the preparation for self-defense made by South Carolina in 1707 and 1708, acts were passed giving the commanding officer of any expedition the power of commissioner to buy all, all prisoners of the Indian enemy above the age of 12 years that should be taken captive by the white forces or the Indian allies. The slaves so bought were to be delivered to the public receiver, who was directed to pay for them not to exceed the sum of seven pounds for every Indian, and then to ship them to the islands of the West Indies for sale. Where? To the West Indies. Indian slaves from Caribana trade and labor in the 17th century Caribbean. And it says here, the rebellion of Metacomb, King Philip's War, 1676-1678, against New England had united multiple indigenous nations. News of this united rebellion created paranoia among the Barbados Assembly, representing the interests of a large plantation owners about importing Native Americans as slaves to Barbados, as they might incite similar revolts against the colonists. The Barbados legislators did not aim to prevent the import of all Indian slaves, however, but only the Indians from New England New York and Rhode Island, who were known to be notorious vigilantes and obstinate, incorrigible rogues and cunning thieves. It would not be until 1688 that the Barbados Assembly decided to outlaw the importation of all Indian slaves to Barbados, which suggests that routes and means of acquiring Indian slaves, apart from connections to North America, had been operating without major opposition for a long time prior to this legislation. All right, did you hear that? Indian slavery was being practiced and operating way before 1688, all right, without major opposition for a long time. Indian slaves from New England and New Netherland, or New York, right, had indeed been a part of the English and Dutch Caribbean landscape since the early 17th century the early 15th, 1600s meaning 15 you know even the late 15th, you know 1590s right because in going into 1600 right in bermuda in bermuda english providence island and we got providence island that's off the coast of nicaragua and Honduras. they were sending pequits over there calling them cannibal negroes all right enslaving the pequits and sending them to providence island another pilgrim colony the one they don't teach you about and curacao dutch however it is unclear how many indian slaves from north america were in barbados itself at the time of the 1676 and 1688 acts in most instances historians have used sources from new england saying that these captives were sent to the west indies all right west indies historians have guessed that they went to barbados since it was the largest recipient of slaves in the English Atlantic for most of the 17th century. For this dissertation, the records reviewed of Indian slaves in Barbados and Suriname do not provide irrefutable evidence of this matter either, since they conflate the origins of all native people, peoples of the Americas into one category, Indian. Or they know that there are other slaves within it, the list of Negroes. All right. So as you can see, none of these deeds or records says Africans. I hope you've noticed in that. All right. So it's Indian, Negroes and other slaves. They never say Africans really in those times without indicating who or how many of these others were. Right. So they're basically letting you know you can't really know what they're 
what tribes were there, where, what native, you know, American natives were being enslaved from where, what specific places of Americas, because they were just listing them as Indians or Negroes or other slaves. And she's telling you right now, this lady who wrote this paper, you know, these things, they're not indicating who or how many of these others were. They're not really indicating, you know, specifics. Consequently, calculating the exact demographics of Indian slaves on the island, as Jerome S. Handler has noted, is an impossibility. Despite the challenge, identifying the origins of the Indian slaves of Barbados reveals how indigenous people throughout the Caribbean influenced colonization both on Barbados and through Barbados' influence throughout the Americas. The evidence presented in this dissertation shows that we must start our investigation of Indian slavery more locally, as Worsley suggested, within the Caribbean itself. All right, she's letting you know, if you really want to see foundational truth, you have to really search more locally, not from and over there in Africa, but locally, as Worsley suggested, within the Caribbean itself, they were enslaving American Indians. My dissertation reveals the context for Indian rebellions, both feared and real, through a narrative of colonial indigenous trade and enslavement in the Caribbean since the 1580s, leading up to the period of the 1670s and 1680s, when colonial legislatures began limiting the trade in Indian slaves. This legislation appeared in Barbados and colonies founded by Bar Bar Barbadians. In Carolina, Alan Galley describes the 1680s as a period when the legislature there began to publish and distribute regulations against keeping Indian slaves. They also proposed penalties against colonists, interfering with Indian embassies, and instructed the government and council to establish a commission to meet at least every two months in Charlestown to hear all complaints. These laws eventually failed, however, as the colonial legislature did not have the resources to enforce them, nor necessarily the will of the people, Galley suggests that the Indian captives exported from Carolina from the late 17th century through the 18th century most likely ended up in Barbados. Again, they'll tell us in history books and when we go read about sugar plantations and all that in Barbados, Jamaica, all that, they'll always keep telling us that they kept getting slaves from West Africa. But when we do the tr we search, you know, through this, uh, you know, through the history, follow the trail, you'll see that in these res in sources, in these original sources, none, nobody's talking about Africans. And you'll see that it's actually more uh, American Indians being taken to these places for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, by like the thousands. All right. Because of the strong trade connections between the two colonies and Barbados' insatiable demand for slaves during this period, however, Galley acknowledges that import records for Barbados do not exist to verify this. My research cor corroborates that Barbados did indeed have precedents of receiving Indian slaves, but I have only found evidence that they were from the Circum Caribbean region prior to the 1670s and Caribbean Indians probably continue to be the majority of Indian slaves in Barbados because of the aforementioned legislation preventing North American imports in 1676 and 1687. This dissertation shows that Barbados may not have imported North American Indian slaves before this period, but it did export the tradition of subsuming indigenous people within the category of Negroes, Indians, and other slaves into the black coats to North American colonies, making Indians, particularly Carib Indians, subject to an imposed racial identity. They were calling these Carib Indians what? Negroes, Indians, or other slaves. Negroes, black coats. All right, and it's titled Indian Slavery in Colonial Times Within the Present Limits of the United States by Alman Wheeler Lauber, PhD. At meeting of the Plymouth Court in 16. 76. To consider the disposal of more than a hundred captives, the conclusion was reached upon serious and deliberate consideration and agitation, conquering them, to sell the greater number into servitude, again, into what? Servitude. A little later, in the same year, several more were sold. In each case, a colonial treasurer was ordered 
to affect the sale for the benefit of the colony. A fiscal report of Plymouth for the period from June 25, 1675 to September 23, 1676 gives among the credits the following, which relates to the sale of up to 188 Indians already mentioned by the following accounts received in or as silver captives for 188 prisoners at war sold prisoners of war so remember where they, they took these prisoners right they took them to Spain prisoners of war Spain records of similar events are found in Massachusetts Bay on November 4th 1676 the magistrates and deputies adopted a report of committee of the general court providing for the selling abroad of several Indians. Again, on September 16, 1676, the General Court passed an act for handling over the disposal of certain captured Indians to the council. The General Court expressed the opinion that such of them had shed English blood should suffer death. The inference concerning the remainder is that they were to be sold. Continuing in the book, Indian Slavery in Colonial Times Within the Present Limits of the United States, so here the colonial governments not only sold the Indian captives themselves, but sometimes authorized their military commanders so to do. On January 15, 1676, the governor of Massachusetts issued instructions to Captain Benjamin Church to go against the Indians and to distribute among his men the plunder and captives according to such agreement as Captain and Company might make. The instructions read, And it shall be lawful, and is hereby war warranted for him to make sale of such prisoners as their perpetual slaves or otherwise to retain them as they think meet they being such as the law allows to be kept on august 28 1676 also the governor of plymouth wrote to the governor of rhode island that captain church had been chosen and authorized by plymouth to demand and receive of the governor of rhode island all the captive indians and to guard and conduct them to plymouth or to sell and dispose of them as he chose to the inhabitants or others for terms of life or for shorter terms as there may be reasons no exception to this custom of enslavement was made in the case of the praying indians during the course of the war several of these indians through the harsh dealings of the english and because of neglect to provide them with sufficient shelter protection and encouragement joined the warring indians such of these Indians as were taken in arms were declared by the Massachusetts General Court to be in rebellion and were tried and sentenced, some to be killed, but the most of them to be transported and sold as slaves. In the article again, Indian Slavery in Colonial Georgia, uh, we continue, says, On April 8, 1776, the Georgia Gazette advertised to be sold on Friday the 17th instant at the exchange a handsome young Indian princess. Since Mary Bosomworth had already proclaimed herself an Indian princess, the Vendu masters Edwin and Bolton doubtless stressed the truth no more than she had done, perhaps in hopes of attracting high bids from local brothels. In 1771, a Spanish fellow, Emmanuel, probably an Indian or a musty from Spanish America, was valued at 60 pounds on the estate of the deceased William Carr near Sunbury. In 1772, George Galfin, who did his business mostly in Georgia, Purchased from trader John Milley, an Indian boy captured by the Tomatli Indians in a raid on a plantation in Pensacola Bay. The other Indian slaves, both two other Indian slaves, both probably Native Americans, attempted to escape and were advertised in the Georgia Gazette as runaways. On February 17, 1768, it advertised for a dark Indian fellow, a dark Indian fellow. The property of William Lifford escaped from the Elizabeth and Mary Captain Samuel Cobble's pilot boat. On September 22, 1775, it advertised for an Indian slave named Sandy, about 20 years of age, wearing a blue vest with gold gilt buttons and dark breeches with white metal buttons, a brown colored surto coat, a hat and blue and white handkerchief upon his head an old nice brick shirt and a pair of green negro cloth indian boots tied with red garters he speaks very bad scotch advertisements for musties during the period appeared more frequently the seizure of indians by authority of the colonial government and their subsequent sale were not always above suspicion 
at the time of the Narragansett Troubles. In 1646, Plymouth gave legal sanction for the seizure of peaceable and unsuspecting Indians whose tribes were at peace with the English. A second instance of the same character occurred during King Philip's War, shortly after the destruction of Dartmouth in 1675. The Dartmouth Indians had not been concerned in the burning of the town, so the whites entered into the negotiations of peace and friendship with them. The captains of the resident militia and the Plymouth forces sent thither promised them protection. But through other influences, they were conducted to Plymouth, and by order of the council, August 4, 1675, they were sold and transported out of the country, being about eight score persons. So you hear that? So these people said, we, you know, we want to be at peace, we surrender, we do a treaty with you. They still were sold and transported out of the country. Again, when the article Indian slavery in colonial Georgia and continues says there were doubtless scores of other Indian slaves in Georgia, perhaps hundreds for their enslavement persisted throughout the colonial period. In 1738, a trader who had just returned from the Creeks, Chickasaws, and Cherokees assured Pastor Bolsius, or Granau, that these tribes cannot live long without war, and therefore many hostile Indian slaves are bought and sold to the Europeans. In 1772, David Tate, John Stewart, emissary to the Creeks, felt that he had to instruct a Mistisigio, chief of the Little Talassis, not to let his people take in any Indian slaves from the plantations. The sufferings of whites captured by the Indians were often published by the captives soon after they were freed and have been reprinted in the Garland Library of Narratives of North American Indian Captivities, which includes some 311 titles. The sufferings of the Indian slaves who then lacked a written language and were rarely free to learn and use any other remain unchronicled. So again, we're still in the book, Indian Slavery in Colonial Times Within the Present Limits of the United States by Almond Wheeler Lauber, PhD. Again, this is Studies in History, Economics and Public Law, edited by the Faculty of Political Science of Columbia. In 1708, the Canadian French were exciting the Indians about Kaskaskia to wage war with each other and were on the spot to get slaves to sell to the English so they would stir up trouble, make them go to war with each other, and then they would take the captives as prisoners or slaves to sell to, to the English. So the French were selling American Indians as slaves to the English. These were not Africans. In 1524, accordingly, Verrazano attempted to capture an Indian family consisting of an old woman, a young girl, and six children on the northeast coast of North America. All right? We got that in the past videos. We also got in this same account, in this same book from 1524 of Verrazano, he clearly states that the same Indians he was trying to kidnap were black, unlike Ethiopians. Right? They were dark skinned. They were so called Negro. All right. Verrazano said this in 1524. All right. But in this story, when he tried to kidnap him, this continues here says, But the girl proved so intractable that the soldiers were forced to give up the attempt to take the whole family to the ship and finally carried away but one small boy who was too young to make any resistance. That's so messed up. Imagine that could be your son they took. In Carter's first expedition in 1534, he seized some of the natives and carried them on board his ships. Where? On what? On his ships. We're just talking about Deuteronomy 28. On ships, right? And continues as the relations with the Indians were so friendly that he was able, by gifts and explanations, to persuade them that he meant no harm. So you see the evil nature of these people, right? Tricking your ancestors being all nice to them and then grabbing them up and enslaving them. Two of them were finally detained on board and carried to France. On the, carried where? To France, to Europe. On the second expedition in 1535, Cartier, replying to the request of the chief, Taiguragui, that the French carry away another chief, Agona, declared that the king of France had forbidden him to bring back either man or woman and permitted him to bring to France only two or three little boys to learn the language. 
but these pretended instructions did not prevent Cartier from seizing Taiguragui and other chiefs for the purpose of carrying them to France. Chiefs! The great purpose of the French in the New World was trade. All right, trade, trade. All right, but we're starting to realize it was basically slave trade. Not just the word trade, like we're thinking, oh, they were trading fur, um, you know, spices, fruits, whatever. No, it was human cargo, slave trade. All right, they're leaving a word out of this. Their expeditions, excluding those of the missionaries, were commercial in nature. Commercial key words here with them gold hunting was not a primary consideration they didn't care about gold nor were they seeking a refuge from persecution like the english the great fur trade was being developed by them this trade was carried on with the indians and in all sections were captives in war or kidnapped indians were purchased from the natives such purchase was usually a part of the trade in furs The custom of purchasing Indians originated with the early explorers and discoverers. Purchasing Indians. We, we ain't talking about Africans being purchased here. De Bourgmont sent some of those whom he purchased back to New Orleans. La Verendrie also in 1731 sent back slaves to French settlements and in writing of his action implied that he thought he deserved much credit for furnishing the colonists with slaves all right so again all these slaves they're not african the french are enslaving your ancestors until well into the latter half of the 18th century indian slaves were held by the settlers of detroit who obtained them in trade with friendly indians who in turn took them in war with the pawnee osage chakta and other western tribes all right indian slaves were held in detroit in 1741 the so-called nation of the serpent entirely destroyed 17 villages killed all the men and older women made slaves of the young women and traded them for horses and other merchandise a report to the home government in 1720 concerning nachi toches declared that the most extensive commerce which could be carried on with the Indians of that section would be in slaves, horses, skins, etc. Okay, so again, the French were here mainly for trade and their venture was mainly commercial purposes and the primary uh, thing helping this was slaves, American Indian slavery, workforce, free labor, Another report sent by LaSalle told of the Alabama Indians bringing 27 or 28 mobile Indian women and children into the colony and disposing of them to the French. The friendly and allied Indians appreciated the results to be obtained from the sale of their captives to the whites and not only sold them to the couriers, the bus, and other traveling traders, but took them directly to the French settlement for sale as is shown in the preceding paragraph so can you imagine in this in these times all these this was a big hustle like think about it man apparently all the leading french settlements afforded a ready market for such slaves again apparently all the leading french settlements all right afforded a ready market for such slaves all these French colonies, settlements in America were basically taken in American Indian slaves. Mostly not Africans show us the African records. All right, there is a real history being told here and recorded. Mobile furnishes a case in point. On November 1706, a party of Wacha, Wa, Wacha arrived in the settlement, bringing some Abnaki captives for sale. In the same month, also some Chakta brought to the settlement Kawita and Altamaha captives for the same purpose. All right, so everybody was in the game, whether it was for survival or whatever, but a lot of the tribes were doing it to each other. All right, 
and it's interesting this tribal name Kawita because we got a town in our indigenous region called Talamanca in Costa Rica called Kawita. The colonists favored the same action for a more commercial reason. The French of Kaskaskia in 1708 were urging the allied Indians to war and were on the spot to obtain captives to sell as slaves to the English. De Vaudreau, governor general of Canada, throughout the first quarter of the 18th century was urging the Abnaki to wage war on the Illinois to obtain slaves for him. An important factor in the French colonial trade was the couriers de bois, the bois. These men having cut loose from civilization wandered at will among the Indians, trading for the various commodities which they could dispose of in the settlements of either the French or English colonies. All right, so they say trade, you know, we got to have the, you know, open quotes, close quotes, trade, right? They were basically slavers, a lot, most of them. That was the real hustle. That was the real, like in today, that would be the money. All right. One of these commodities was Indian slaves. Okay. One of these commodities is the major commodity. You are the gold obtained for the most part from the tribes who had captured them in war. Judging from the number of these white men of the woods, their unrestrained life and the evidence given by the men of the time. It seems not unlikely that this feature of colonial trade produced a considerable portion of Indian slaves used by the French. If the couriers de Boas did not find a sufficient number of slaves among the tribes they visited, they not infrequently stirred up the tribes to war so that they might obtain the captives for sale. Some of the most prominent ones were engaged in this same slave trade with the English. Again, these French colonial officials, the most prominent ones, were actually engaged in this same slave trade, the American Indian slave trade. With who? With the English. Both of them enslaving American Indians. They're not getting them from Africa. And when appearing to be opposed to it, in 1708, Bienville ordered the Canadian French to cease exciting the Indians of Kaskaskia to wage war on each other to obtain slaves for them. Yet in the same year, he proposed, since the French would not cultivate the land, to obtain the needful supply of labor by seasoned Indians and sending them to the West Indies in exchange for Negroes or other American Indians. Key word, they say Negroes, right? They don't say Africans. The slave trade had evidently become enough of a problem in the plains by the late 1710s that French officials identified it as their primary obstacle to commercial and political expansion. In 1717, Francois de Le Marie, a priest who had served for nearly a decade in the settlement of Mobile, composed a memoir on Louisiana in which he recommended that the French crown outlaw the Indian slave trade in the Great Plains. It was so major it was affecting so much what was going on right they wanted to control it really that's what they really wanted to do all right so they wanted to uh, outlaw it supposedly because it was so major right indian slave trade was this is not africans again indian slave trade he specifically condemned those couriers the boys the couriers the boys like pudret who bought and sold slaves of padukas and other peoples of the missouri a ban on the slave trade would he concluded cut at the root, the wars that the Indians only continue between themselves because of the advantageous sale that they make of their captives to the traders, who then resell them in this colony to the Spanish and to the vessels that come to our port for selling them a third time to the islands. All right. Who were they giving the Spanish and who was um, going to these islands in the West Indies? American Indians, not Africans. All right, there was a whole circle of slave trade, right? We're starting to see, right? This is, this is starting to add up to you. In the simpler life of the inhabitants of the Illinois country, agriculture was the chief industry of the settlers until the close of the period under discussion. And the farmers increased the results of their industry by the extensive use of Indian slaves. All right, not African slaves, Indians slaves. 
Throughout the French territory, in the military stations, both soldiers and frontiersmen found use for their Indian women slaves as cooks and in performing the other domestic labors of fort and camp. The male slaves were used in erecting fortifications. You build their towers. You build their municipalities, their government buildings, their town halls, their city halls. You build it performing other heavy labor and as guides in military expeditions marriage between french and indians was common all right so marriage between french and indians all right so not africans slaves right because when we know about what they start saying mulattoes right and how you know these french colonies you know the french were marrying with the uh, slave girls who are supposed to be right african descendants but they were really marrying so-called Negro girls, right? But they were Indians. So French, uh, marriage between French and Indians was common. The social result of these close connections was more pronounced in case of the Frenchman than in that of the Indian. It meant that Indianizing of the Frenchman or the bringing him to the social level into the life and habits of the red man. He took on your ways, copper color tribe. The Louisiana church records certain accounts of the birth, baptism, marriage, and burial of Indian slaves. All right, not African slaves. The Mobile and New Orleans registers are similar to the church registers to be found throughout Lower Canada, wherever a church was established. All right, so all these places, the records, the registers, similar, right? It was Indian slaves, Indians. Indians raised in the early history of Vincennes, most of the slaves were Indians. Indians, for the inhabitants were more extensively engaged in the Indian trade than in agricultural pursuits. The same was true of the country about Detroit. Again, Indian slaves, all right, mostly Indian slaves in Detroit, not Africans. Indian slaves, mostly children, are recorded in Detroit in 1710. 1712 and 1715 their use continued there until the english occupation all right indian slave children a report in 1733 shows that the canadians trading in indian slaves whom they seized or purchased from other indians studies in the history of economics and public law edited by the faculty of political science of columbia university